We're going to pick up with the second panel, and is is clear already. Um, we could write an entire volume just about the history of assessment and testing in the United States and every one of these topics. But um, with um, with this panel, what we start is a set of discussions where papers have been. Uh, written about particular contexts of, of the use of assessment. Um, and in this session, we're talking about assessments for system monitoring. We have uh, two papers, um, one that is uh, by a, a group of co-authors, Aaron Fa is it Fail? Uh, Failey. Failey, Ben Shear, and Kenneth Shores. Um, and uh, they're going to be focusing on examples of system monitoring largely with respect to things like NAEP and state assessment. And then um, Henry Braun and Judy Singer are going to be looking at it from the perspective of international assessments. And Jack Buckley has graciously dis uh, agreed to serve as a discussant. The way we're going to do this session is, um, is Ben will present um, their paper and then um, Henry and Judy will present their paper, and then Jack will discuss the two together. Um, so I'll turn it over to, to Ben. Great. Okay, yeah, I've got this. <clears throat> uh, great, thank you, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's uh, great to be here. I think I speak for the three of us when I say that we're uh, very honored to have been invited um, and look forward to learning a lot and getting feedback uh, while we're here and hopefully uh, feel that we can share uh, some interesting um, insights and ideas to the volume. Uh, oh, right, I've got to start this. Uh, great, so <clears throat> I'd like to just have a few acknowledgements. Uh, so as mentioned, this is a uh, paper that I've uh, co-authored with Aaron and Ken uh, who are here as well. Uh, and we've benefited greatly some, uh, from some feedback of sort of mentors and advisors of ours, uh, Sean Reardon, and Andrew Ho, Ed Hartle. And of course, thank you to the organizers of the volume for bringing all of us together here today. Uh, so you may be wondering why uh, only I am up here. Uh, we just sort of decided among the three of us that it would be better to have one person up here instead of try to do three people in uh, 18 minutes. And although we didn't have a three-sided coin, we did literally um, <laughs> just go to random.org and randomly decide who would present, uh, and it was me. We, we did this a week ago, so I prepared, you know, this wasn't this morning, but. Uh, so, uh, if I say anything foolish, that's my fault. If I say something interesting, it's probably thanks to my co-authors. Uh, so we start in the paper by talking a little about, like, what do we mean by system monitoring? Because I think that can have a lot of different uh, uh, sort of meanings and, and interpret it in different ways. And so we talk a little bit about that. We're thinking about using tests here to uh, kind of gather ongoing data about the education system, right? So maybe this is something akin to collecting quarterly employment data, um, think about sort of like just taking the pulse a little bit to see, uh, to learn a bit more about what's going on. One thing that's uh, to note is that, you know, we're thinking that test scores and tests might be one of many indicators that we're looking at to track the education system. Uh, one thing that's useful about test scores is that they're an outcome measure in addition to the many various measures we might have of inputs into the education system. Um, you know, tests serve as one useful indicator of uh, skills that, skills and knowledge that students uh, have learned in school. Um, uh, sort of a distinction would be that we're thinking about using tests and system monitoring here without direct consequences or decisions being made as might be done in an accountability system. Uh, so that's sort of uh, one distinction. Uh, and another is that we're thinking about this looking at using test scores to sort of track changes and trends and achievement at the sort of broad uh, system level, 30,000 foot level, maybe at the national state level, rather than say using tests or assessments in a classroom context to track student learning of individual students and then inform instructional decisions. So those are both topics that are going to be, I think, discussed in other papers uh, at this conference. Uh, so then we tried to step back and think a little bit about, so uh, on the one hand, you can sort of make, I think, the case that, oh, well, having more data about the education system is better. And that sort of sounds good, but then we wanted to try to think about a little bit more explicitly and specifically about, well, how might tests actually be used when we're monitoring the system to somehow improve education or, or make decisions? And we drew a bit on um, a, a sort of, I don't know if it can be quite called a framework, but I, I suppose we'll refer to it as a framework by, um, that Ed Hartle proposed a few years ago when he sort of was thinking about what are the general ways, sort of broad ways in which tests get used, and he sketched out seven broad uses of tests. And so we tried to pick a few, we actually focused on three, uh, that seemed like they were relevant for system monitoring. 
And so the first broad use is the idea of using test scores to shape perceptions. And so here the idea is that almost just simply by reporting uh, large-scale data, say about student achievement in the U.S., um, I suppose I should step back and say, I'm, we're going to be focused, we discussed uh, using tests to monitor the education system in the U.S. specifically, uh, and the next paper is talking about in a more international context. Uh, and that simply by reporting the results even descriptively, uh, that can shape people's perceptions. Uh, when we think about an example of the NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which I think many people here are familiar with, uh, NAEP also then reports uh, things like proficiency levels or proficiency rates, uh, and that requires something maybe one step beyond a purely descriptive account, which a sort of a test score might be, uh, to sort of saying, well, is this a high level of performance? Is this a proficient grade level performance or not? Uh, and certainly where those standards get set, and then as a result, what the proficiency rates are or are not in certain places, that can shape perception, and sort of shape uh, perception about how the education system is changing over time or not. Uh, another of the main uses is the idea of educational management, and here the idea is trying to describe the performance of particular actors within the education system, whether that's states, districts, could all the way go down to the level of schools and teachers. Um, and then the idea is that although a lot of times educational management would lead to an accountability system, in other cases it could just be used to try to help inform decision making, either identify problematic areas where there we could sort of uh, direct different resources, uh, or maybe identify success stories and sort of learn from and leverage best practices. Uh, and then the third is the idea of comparing programs and policies. And so here the idea is to actually see if we can use test scores to evaluate the impact or effect of different policies, different programs, different curricula on student learning and student achievement. Um, uh, right, and that's sort of straightforward. So uh, in some ways we can think about these as kind of different layers of inferences, so from the sort of uh, primarily descriptive inferences that we would get from just reporting the uh, aggregate trends over time or across places. Although I will say that I think a lot of the questions raised in the earlier session, although we don't address in this paper, we take very seriously that you know you could question what is on these tests, are they measuring sort of the right thing, uh, and that's I think worth worth thinking about as well, even at the sort of the initial descriptive layer, uh, and then when we sort of make determinations about whether a particular performance level is proficient or not, that's making a more evaluative um, uh, inference and is sort of a, it requires additional assumptions. And then if we sort of try to evaluate the effectiveness of different programs and policies, we're now trying to make causal inferences and explain variation in scores, so making yet additional layers of inferences. Um, and these can sort of feed into what's probably familiar with many people here, the idea of an interpretation or use argument that sort of every use or interpretation of a test score should be evaluated, should sort of be clearly stated how is this test score meant to be used, what sorts of effects are we intending it to have, um, and then think about what evidence there is to uh, support those uh, inferences and uses, and also importantly to attend to what are maybe some potential unintended effects. And so uh, even I think in the case of testing for system monitoring where there may not be direct consequences from the results of the uh, scores, certainly uh, because they're reported publicly and they can often influence uh, policy decisions, there can be ways in which perhaps they could lead to a narrowing of the curriculum, incentives to try to um, artificially inflate scores, um, or you know, a big concern I think is sort of looking at scores and looking at variation across places and leaping to causal inferences without maybe all of the necessary uh, assumptions being warranted. Uh, right, and so of course making more, uh, stronger inferences about scores and explain the variation makes more assumptions. Uh, and then one theme, I think, uh, I forget if it was um, Michael or Amy was mentioning sort of looking forward, you know, uh, I think one of the themes that will come up a bit in some of the examples I'll show in a moment is the idea of how, what we can get from linking and combining different data sources. Um, and so we can think about that both in the sense of linking and combining different data sets of uh, test scores, so data from different tests, as well as combining, you know, it's sort of just much more feasible now to combine very large databases, whether it's um, information on the context of education and demographic data or test scores, uh, and that when you look at test scores within that broader context, you can often get much more informative uh, information from them, particularly for uh, system monitoring. Uh, so a couple of uh, illustrations that we include. Uh, we start by talking about the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or NAEP. Um, I'm sure many of you, maybe probably all of you, are familiar with this, uh, perhaps more familiar than uh, we are. And, um, uh, but the reason we highlight this is because 
it was a test that's designed intentionally for system monitoring, to have the role of sort of monitoring student achievement in the US, but to be low stakes and to be independent. Um, and uh, right, so it's sort of sometimes referred to as something like a large scale group score assessment, which I think many of the tests and assessments that um, Henry and Judy will be talking about are, in the sense that it's intended to produce descriptive data about achievement at uh, high levels of aggregation. So it doesn't report scores for individual students or even individual schools. Um, and although that would be possible, it's sort of the test isn't designed to provide good information at those levels of aggregation. Um, uh, but it does disaggregate by different demographic groups, which has been sort of an important part of the mission of NAEP is to report on uh, the relative achievement of different groups of students. Um, uh, it's administered, you know, currently, as many of you know, primarily in fourth and eighth grade, in some cases in 12th grade, and the primary or sort of most often reported interpreted scores, I think, and what we'll focus on here, are in the domains of reading and mathematics. I won't go spend a lot of time on some of the different um, design features, but we did want to sort of highlight and list a few of the things that uh, are sort of unique to NAEP relative to some other large-scale testing programs, in particular state accountability tests, which we'll also talk about. Um, uh, and because it's designed really for this um, sort of large-scale aggregate monitoring purpose, uh, and so that it's got independent oversight by the NAGB, uh, that the content is established by a range of stakeholders, although again, I think questions were raised in the last session about perhaps there should be more input or we should think about different ways to decide what content goes into those tests. Um, it uses matrix sampling and aggregate score reporting. We saw this as sort of both a strength and a weakness. Uh, in one sense, it's a strength because it allows sort of a broad range of content sampling um, and a representative sample of students in the, in the U.S. and in different states. Um, uh, on the other hand, you know, it, it sort of doesn't allow for reporting of achievement at lower levels of aggregation. And on the one hand, that's sort of a limitation that we don't get as fine-grained data. On the other hand, it could be a strength in the sense that if you can't report uh, results for, say, individual schools, that re reduces any potential incentive effects that you might get from identifying the performance of individual actors. Uh, of course, it's designed to be, have stability and comparability across time and across states, um, right, which is, so NAEP is sort of one of the few tests that can be compared across states. Uh, although it's changing a little bit now, it's uh, still maybe not uniform. Uh, and then the, all of the work that goes into the dissemination and interpretation of NAEP uh, results. So NAEP's data are reported in many different ways and in a range of reports designed from, uh, reports that are designed for the general public all the way to these sort of very um, detailed data files that can be requested for researchers to support uh, research purposes. And so as an uh, illustration of the sort of uh, initial this kind of descriptive data that we're envisioning in system monitoring, um, so hopefully that's visible from where I know it's, uh, apologies, it's slightly small, especially some of the text. Uh, essentially, this shows data from the long-term trend NAEP assessment. Uh, and so it shows average scores uh, across time from the 1970s up until around 2010. Uh, and each panel is a different age of students in different subjects. So the top row of plots show average uh, math scores, the lower row average reading scores on the long-term trend, and every line is a different subgroup of students within the U.S., one of the main subgroups that NAEP reports for, so separated by um, student gender and then student race. And so this allows us to sort of make inferences and track changes in uh, overall aggregate level achievement at the national level uh, across long periods of time. Right, then to try to understand, you know, what's happening, you know, we can see that the trend is generally upward, although it's not uniformly so between every period of reporting. Um, and this is sort of what we're imagining is that initial kind of um, pretty uh, purely descriptive information about student achievement. Uh, but NAEP also reports things, uh, right, it's referred to as the nation's report card, which is sort of an implicitly evaluative uh, way to report the results. And here, um, it's not the particular results that we're looking at, but so much is the idea that here in NAEP, the, what's being reported is the percent of students that are proficient in different uh, grades and subject areas, right? And so now we're not only describing performance, but uh, also the performance is being evaluated. Is this proficient grade level performance or not? Which sort of we thought goes one step beyond trying to simply describe what students know and are able to do, but then uh, also evaluates that. Uh, okay, so. Right, sort of, certainly a, a strength of NAEP, as I've just mentioned, is that it's comparable across time and place, so we can compare performance across states, we can look at trends in performance and achievement across time. Um, but as I also noted, 
NAEP is only administered in a limited number of grades and years, and primarily only reported at fairly high levels of aggregation. So there are now some very large urban districts where uh, NAEP results are reported, but that's a relatively small uh, portion of districts in the U.S. Um, on the other hand, if we sort of wanted to know more about finer grain variations and patterns of achievement at the national level, well, nearly every student does take a state accountability test uh, pretty much every year, at least in grades three through eight, and then occasionally in high school, uh, in math and in English language arts every year, and in some other subjects in other years. So there is a lot more data on student achievement uh, that we have. Uh, on the other hand, it's not comparable across states, and even in some cases when states change their tests, not comparable across time. So with the new Common Core uh, Consortia test, there are now some ways we might be able to compare across states, uh, but not across all states, um, and that seems to be changing every year, uh, sort of which states are, are administering which tests and if they're really the same. Um, so the next uh, sort of illustration we use is, shows how, to, how uh, we've been involved in an effort to link these two data sources in an attempt to try to get sort of finer grain data about the variation in achievement across the U.S. Um, that we think could sort of be useful in supporting those uses, particularly the educational management and comparing programs and policies. That if we have more data about the variation in achievement uh, and we can combine that with information about different policies and practices, uh, we could reach more detailed conclusions. And the initiative that we talk about is called the Stanford Education Data Archive, or, or CETA. Um, and essentially we use uh, the NAEP data from every state to link state accountability tests onto a common scale. The accountability, state accountability test data comes from the NCES's EdFact database, and so at this point I think it represents something like approximately 200 million standardized test scores across the country for many years. Um, and by linking them with NAEP, we uh, are able to report a measure of achievement uh, for nearly every district in the U.S. from the years 2000 nine through 15 and third through eighth grade math and English language arts, um, and reported separately by student race and gender, so similar to the plots that I showed earlier. Um, and then also in the database are uh, a rich set of district level demographic data and covariates from the common core of data and the census. Uh, and I think it's important to note that these measures are perhaps in some ways best described as measures of educational opportunity across the U.S., um, rather than say direct measures of school or district quality because so many things factor into the relative level of achievement test scores. Um, uh, many of you probably will just want to kind of squint at this uh, because of what we've done here. But this is, uh, this is just sort of what we, an illustrative map, and it's the average NAEP, scale, uh, NAEP score for every state across subjects, years, and grades. So it's not a terribly uh, meaningful to rep interpret any one state sort of uh, level there. The point is that when we have NAEP, with NAEP data, we can look at variation across states, right? Uh, but what you'll see there is outlined uh, in the map are the boundaries of all U.S. school districts. And so with CETA, when we combine the NAEP data and the accountability test data, we can then start to look at variation across districts within states, right? And so we can see that still there's a lot of variation across states, but there's also a lot of variability in achievement within states but across districts um, that can then be studied to try to learn more about how the education system is functioning for different students and in different places. Um, and uh, so then as an example, because uh, CETA also includes covariate information, uh, we can look at, so this shows the relationship between on the x-axis median family income in a school district and average achievement on the y-axis on this sort of NAEP link scale. And I've, we've highlighted here, uh, all of the blue points represent districts in California and the orange points districts in Massachusetts as just two examples. Uh, to see that although there is a fairly consistent relationship between family income in a district and achievement, which I think many of us have seen before in test scores, that relationship isn't necessarily uniform across different states and districts. And so we can study variation. We've also included in CETA measures of the average change in achievement from third through eighth grade. And so we can look now here on the y-axis at change in achievement from third to eighth grade relative to income. And here there's less of a relationship and it's sort of more mixed across the two states. And so this prevents, uh, presents yet a different picture of how the education system is functioning for different students um, in different places. I'm running a bit short on time, so uh, should I move ahead? So we then uh, go through and, and sort of try to very succinctly summarize and just point towards a couple of examples in which people have used either NAEP data or CETA data in conjunction with knowledge of variation in programs and policies and quasi-experimental methodologies to try to infer or make causal inferences about the effects of some of these different programs and policies 
on achievement test scores uh, using either NAEP or CETA, right, and where we point out that sort of the public availability of these data make these sorts of endeavors possible. Uh, so I won't talk through all of these now uh, in the interest of time and said jump to the sort of conclusion. So one is that um, it seems that there's a lot of value in having something like NAEP, the sort of low stakes, uh, it's this large scale comparable measure of achievement over time and across places. Uh, the second, sort of looking forward, that, that really where things head are, it seems to be that when we try to link and merge some of these databases, we can get a much more detailed picture and we can better interpret maybe in some cases, why do we see the variations in achievement that we see? Uh, the third is that, of course, as we go about linking and combining these different data sources, we're making a lot of assumptions along the way. And so we've been involved in, and there are other papers coming out that, for example, look into the validity of the estimates provided in CETA. Do they really measure the things that we think they do? Uh, but that's an important thing to attend to. Uh, and then finally, of course, mentioning, as others have, the strengths and limitations of test scores as indicators. They represent only one of many uh, things that we hope the education system uh, will uh, try to sort of teach students or as one outcome that we hope the education system will lead to, um, but at the same time represents sort of an important piece of what schools are trying to do. Uh, that's all I have for now. Great. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. On my behalf and on behalf of Judy Singer, thanks for the opportunity to uh, work on this chapter and to attend this uh, really exceptional uh, gathering. So Judy and I were asked to write about international assessments, and we took as our mandate uh, the goal of trying to explain or uh, to a, a very broad audience who might not know much about international assessments, a little bit about what goes on under the hood, so to speak, as well as talking about <clears throat> the roles that international assessment play. And I think as Ben alluded, the idea of monitoring, if you look at the dictionary, has a number of definitions ranging from sort of passive observation to more active regulation. And it seems to us that international assessment started out on the more passive side uh, as observation, uh, but has moved towards uh, regulation, though indirectly, that is, it's not that international assessments directly regulate uh, educational policy, but they certainly are playing an increasing role in, in the way in which education policy is shaped uh, at the national and even at the global levels. So a little bit of history. Uh, uh, the first international assessment that we recognized took place in about 1964. It was a purely academic exercise, you know, could we do this? And a number of uh, very prominent folks. Uh, figured out how to uh, develop an assessment, translate it, adapt it, and uh, administer it in 12 different countries, and showed, in fact, that you could do something pretty remarkable. Since then, of course, uh, the international large-scale assessments, which we abbreviate ILSAs, uh, have grown in numbers. Uh, they become much more salient. They're now, the release is now uh, a major media event. And one can ask why, why this increase in popularity. A lot of it seems to have to do with governments recognizing that human capital is an important part of uh, their future success. And they see international assessments as one way of tracking slash monitoring uh, the development of human capital, both absolutely but also comparatively. Um, the United States played an important role right through the beginning of international assessments, but interestingly, uh, didn't pay much attention to it from a policy point of view until the mid-2000s. Uh, but now it, it has become, like in many other countries, an important and sometimes misused uh, indicator of the health of the educational system. We'll have more to say about that in a minute. Uh, so it has had a major, it has had a major influence on international uh, education policy. That's not welcomed by all. There are many critiques of the role that international assessments play as sort of like a hegemonic neoliberal uh, approach to uh, stamping out individual idiosyncrasies. And we could have an interesting conversation about that at dinner time after a drink. 
What's interesting is that about the same time, the mid-1960s, in the United States, uh, Francis Keppel and then Howard, Harold Howe, uh, commissioners of education of the Office of Education, decided that uh, the condition of education, which was issued annually by that office, uh, needed to include some output measures in addition to the input measures that had traditionally been uh, used. And so they began a process which culminated in 1969 with the first National Assessment of Educational Progress. I'm not going to go into that uh, in any particular uh, detail because of uh, the other paper. But I will say that um, it was a very uh, ambitious uh, agenda that they set in terms of the number of uh, disciplines that they were going to measure and the way in which they measured it. But one uh, problematic aspect was their decision to use what we would call classical test theory and report results at the item level. The idea is that teachers and administrators would look at individual items and look at the proportion of students who got the item right or wrong and that would then spur uh, achievement. By the 1970s, it was clear that that was not working very well and the Department of Education was looking around for a new approach and Educational Testing Service um, put together a proposal called a new, a new Design for a New Era that was authored by Sam Messick, Al Beaton and Fred Lord uh, and that won the day and I guess uh, NAEP has been at ETS ever since. What's important for the ILSAs is that the technology that was um, presented as that new design involving some combination of item response theory, latent regression, and other number of other sophisticated measures uh, really changed the way in which NAEP was constructed uh, and administered and reported. I'm not going to go into any detail, but that is discussed in the paper itself. Uh, there are probably only two people in this room who really understand what goes on in NAEP. I am not one of them. <laughs> I will say, though, that one of the ways in which NAEP reports results using what are called plausible values, which are these random draws from posterior distributions, have, have been the occasion of enormous amount of confusion that, rest, that uh, even today uh, confuses uh, otherwise sane people. So what about international assessment? So the reason, of course, that I'm mentioning this is that that technology that was pioneered in NAEP is now under the hood of all the international assessments. And so really important to understand that. So what are the major international assessments? Well, there's TIMS, the Trends in International Math and Science Studies, which grew out of that first set of uh, international assessments in the 60s. Uh, then came uh, PISA in 2000, uh, which is uh, administered under the auspices of the OECD. Then the IEA, which sponsors TIMS, came back with PEARLS, which is uh, the reading assessment. And then more recently, we have PIAC, Program in International Assessment of Adult Competencies, which grew out of some of the international large-scale adult literacy assessments. In addition, and we don't talk about this in the paper, there are a number of thematic assessments as well as a number of regional assessments, West Africa, East Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. So really quite an interesting industry. The growth uh, is well measured by or well illustrated by what's happened in PISA, which started with 32 countries and is by now at least 65 countries and other participating jurisdictions. And of course, there are enormous challenges in trying to mount a large-scale international assessment given the growth in numbers and more importantly, the growth in the number of languages and cultures which must be accommodated. Uh, the sponsors, IEA and OECD, uh, are both membership organizations and have somewhat different ways of operating, but we should understand that the agendas of those uh, organizations are set by the member countries, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, see if I can... There we go. So uh, Judy and I, uh, with, along with Naomi Chudovsky, uh, uh, edited a report of a workshop that was conducted uh, two years ago, two one-day workshops, around the issue of international large-scale assessments. And I think the impetus for that was that given their increasing importance, it was perhaps time to gather together folks who had various kinds of interests in international assessments, either from a technical, from a policy, or even from a media point of view, and talk about where they were going, what the, some of the issues were, and where there was consensus and where there was not. So I highly recommend that. Uh, paper, that uh, little monograph to you. There was also, it was also followed by a science article that Judy and I authored called Testing International Assessments. Rankings get the headlines, but often mislead. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a bit. 
Uh, one of the things I think that we tend to forget is what a remarkable achievement international large-scale assessments are. And to be able to mount one of these kinds of assessments across 80, 90 countries or jurisdictions and to get it all out in time and with a high level of fidelity to the original purpose is really remarkable. And Judy came up with a beautiful analogy. Uh, she said, well, you know, we think about Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Fred Astaire was really widely admired for his sophisticated dancing. But Ginger Rogers did everything he did, but in high heels and backwards. And I think that's a pretty good combination, com comparison between national and international assessments. In our paper, uh, we talk about some of the technical considerations in mounting a large-scale international assessment. Among the issues are sampling, and you have this question of how to sample either schools or households. In each country, there's a different set of contractors, a different set of contracting arrangements, and so try to monitor that so that each country carries out its uh, sampling duties responsibly is a major task. Then we turn to the issue of instrumentation, both the cognitive instruments and the background instruments. One of the things that's very important to recognize is that all of these international assessments uh, carry out not only intensive cognitive assessments, but also a very substantial uh, collection of background data to help with the interpretation of the cognitive data. Uh, this cross-cultural equivalence, which is sort of the goal of these international assessments so that we are measuring the same thing irrespective of language and culture. Of course, is an ideal that is never uh, absolutely achieved, but we seem to be coming closer and closer, but of course there are still concerns, and that is one of the challenges to the validity of the international assessments is, is this question of cross-cultural equivalence. The psychometrics, I've already alluded to it, it's very complicated, uh, trying to, particularly as in these all of these assessments, we're trying to measure a number of cognitive domains uh, in a very restricted amount of time, as well as all that background information. And so there's a high, high degree of modeling dependence that goes on in order to be able to report scores for all students on all of the domains, even though no student actually takes assessments in all of, in all of those domains. So it's really the magic of statistical inference that carries the day. Uh, all of these large-scale assessments also generate uh, very substantial technical reports. They put together uh, databases for both public use and, and uh, restricted use and support secondary analysis. So it's a really a major, major industry. Where we are now is in an interesting transition period. Uh, in 2012, PIAC pioneered digitally-based assessments, or what we'll call technology-based assessments. Uh, the idea there is that as we move into a technology-infused world, our assessments should follow suit, if not lead in some ways. And PIAC, in fact, led the way, showing that it was, in fact, possible to mount a large-scale, digitally-based assessment in multiple countries, multiple languages, multiple cultures. Um, one of, the, one of the advantages of moving to digitally-based assessments is the opportunity to develop adaptive assessments. And PIAC had a very mild level of adaptive uh, design, but that's going to only increase as we become more comfortable with the idea of digitally-based assessments. The other assessments, TIMS, PEARLS, PIAC, are all moving in that direction as well. And by the early 2020s, I think pretty much everything is going to be digitally-based. One of the ways in which digitally-based assessments play an important role, of course, is in helping us to do a better job in assessing uh, the leg what I'll call the legacy domains, as well as new, new domains, such as problem solving in technology-rich environments, online reading, and the like. They also help us think about how to do better quality control, both in real time and post hoc. There are probably some concerns about the move to digitally based assessments in the short term, uh, added cost of actually running two different assessments, digitally based and paper based, and also the uh, ongoing concern about uh, introducing construct of relevant variants, particularly because of all the different devices on which uh, students or adults can be taking uh, these assessments. No, wrong way. Hello. Or just do this? No? This one? I think it's going to go back. Okay. Uh huh. There we go. Yeah. That's, thank you. Yeah. So, in, in our uh, report, we listed seven purposes 
of uh, large-scale assessment. They're not exactly the same seven as uh, Ed Hartle suggested. And what we do in our in the report, and what we do to some extent in the chapter, is discuss the. Um, feasibility of carrying out these different purposes using large-scale assessments. We argue that uh, the two most important and most likely uh, concerns that are dealt with in large-scale assessments are transparency and disturbing complacency. Those are at the top. At the bottom is causal inference, which Ben has already described. And we then go on to discuss some of the possible uses and misuses of large-scale assessments, ranging from uh, the question of you know, can we do better than other countries to the question of can we uh, or should we describe our goals for our country's education in terms of moving up the rankings. And we argue that the latter is a very problematic way of thinking about things. Given the time that uh, is remaining, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Judy, who will talk about dissemination and recommendations. Thank you for your attention. So Henry has alluded to rankings, and I would say that the community that disseminates ILSAs is obsessed with rankings, and Henry and I are obsessed with their obsession with rankings. Um, rankings are the standard way in which ILSA results are disseminated. There are lots of other ways. There are lots of reports and lots of pages, but if you pick up a newspaper article about these ILSAs, it's going to be about the rankings. And um, the rankings are problematic for a host of, of reasons, um, but they include some reasons that are tied in with issues with NAEP in terms of looking at status versus change, but also some issues that are unique to international assessments. So for example, the definition of the target populations can differ across the countries. Exclusion of special ed students, for example, is, is a prime example of uh, differences across countries. The amount of uh, effort that families, and in some cases countries, put into private tutoring uh, differs substantially across countries. So to make the claim that it is what's going on in schools that's contributing or causing the test scores can be quite specious when you've got these kinds of differences. That's over and above cross-country equivalents. In addition, rankings actually depend on which countries participate. And the participation of countries even within a particular family of assessments, varies across the assessment periods. So rankings can actually go up or down when scores go down or up. And so this kind of obsession with being number one, which is what this is all about, the arms race, uh, is, we think, rather counterproductive. Um, we had Andreas Schleicher at uh, the launch of the workshop report, and the one message he made very clear was OECD is not getting rid of the rankings. It, um, I'm going to put words in his mouth. It fuels the publicity that, uh, that the OECD gets for PISA, et cetera, around the world. So we're sort of on a mission uh, to, to counteract that. The, um, you can see this in media coverage. I'll just put up a few headlines here. It's all about slides and rankings. Well, actually, the slides and rankings are not necessarily, sometimes are accompanied by increases in test scores. Um, and it's just, uh, and this obsession with the Asian countries. Britain wholesale just committed $50 million to using um, translating Asian countries' math textbooks into English. They did a small pilot, and now they're rolling it out in half of the country's schools, as if it's the textbook that is actually leading to the top performance of the Asian countries. I mean, it's, it, it, I see a lot of people laughing here. It's absurd, but nevertheless, it happens. So what's we found um, subsequent to the workshop report, uh, some folks at Teachers College have done a study of media coverage of ILSAs in Asian countries. So this is something that we didn't have access to because you have to be able to read uh, Japanese and I'll show you Chinese one in an example in a, in a second. Um, this is coverage of 2015 PISA in one of the major Japanese newspapers and it's bragging that the 
um, rankings have actually gone up. You can see it's ranked number two in 2015, and it was only number four in uh, 2012, and in 2009 it was actually ranked five. But what you'll also see is the mean test score for the country has actually gone down. So the ranking has gone up, but the test score has gone down. But you'd never know that from looking at this graph unless you look at the fine print extremely carefully. Um, here's another example. This is in Chinese Taipei, is another country that scores really well. Uh, the results of PISA 2015 are released. The reading achievement is actually the ranking regressed to seven years ago. Actually, the score was higher. So the students were doing better, but the ranking was lower because the number of countries that are being tested is changing, and the test scores vary over time. Um, so the uh, subsequent headline was, do you believe it? That's what this translation is. The falling of Taiwan in PISA reading is due to a lack of patriotism. So the degree to which some countries, and particularly these Asian countries, trot out these um, anonymous test takers in this low states test, and we've heard reports of putting them up in front of the auditorium, and you're representing the country, could you imagine that happening in the United States? So um, we really would like to do away with rankings. Um, looking forward, uh, we have a few pieces of advice that we offer in this paper. One is that uh, we try to encourage uh, the sponsors to move away from these rankings. Um, that is going to be really hard to do um, because that's what fuels the coverage. But I think both in terms of just being honest about the scores and the potential for uh, online interactive graphs and other kinds of things that would take into account uh, some of the uncertainty associated with the scores and differences uh, over time, I think there is an opportunity for richer communications packages. Second recommendation is something that came out of the workshop. So there used to be a board uh, that corresponded to NAGBI, but it was called BICSI. It was the National Academy uh, of Sciences. It was the Board on International Comparative Studies and Education. And it was designed to provide nonpartisan advice uh, to, the, uh, to, to the Department of Education and its predecessors on, uh, on these assessments, at least in the United States. Uh, at the launch, Tom Loveless went so far as to say, well, if we're going to have a new national board in the United States, why don't we have a new international board uh, that would bring together uh, independent stakeholders from various countries? Uh, we think starting small would probably be a good idea. Uh, and the National Academy of Education is actually having conversations with NCES and with the National Academy of Sciences about the possibility of establishing such a board that could uh, provide independent advice, has the potential to curate uh, the sec many secondary analyses. In fact, there are more secondary analyses than there are individual uh, releases of the reports. So while that's not certain what will come of that, we've at least started the uh, conversations. We also recommend uh, experimenting with things like longitudinal studies. Learning is about status. Uh, learning is about change, not status and these tests measure status. Uh, that's a heavy lift, especially internationally, to track kids over time, but the move to digitally-based assessments provides the opportunity to at least start thinking about this. Um, we close our paper with a sobering note, okay? And I think the sobering note applies not just to our paper, but uh, to, in fact, the, this entire enterprise. Um, the National Academy report that uh, Henry and I uh, co-authored with Naomi uh, got some press, including Jay Matthews in the Washington Post, and he gave it some publicity, which is terrific. And then he ended his op-ed by citing the work, uh, work of Tim Hassey, who I think was actually an NAD postdoc at some point in time. And I'm going to quote from his book in 2002. Politicians define the public good largely in the terms espoused by those who voted for them the stand of their political party, and by those who fund their campaigns. Evidence about what works is usually well down on the list of factors influencing policy. So it's just this sobering reality that we here are quite concerned with the reliability, the validity and, uh, of these assessments and what kinds of uses they have, whether they are being used for the uh, purposes for which they were designed, whether they are being used for other purposes, but ultimately the degree to which we actually influence what happens 
in policy uh, may be um, less than we might have in mind. But hopefully volumes like this that try to get the message out are one way of at least con influencing some degree of the audience uh, that these are well worth doing. We totally believe that ulcers are well worth doing, but if they're well worth doing, they're well worth doing well. Thank you. So uh, I was actually originally asked to be a discussant on a different session uh, of this meeting. And unfortunately for our, our, this panel, uh, I was moved. And I say un unfortunately because I am uh, possibly the, sort of the worst nightmare discussant uh, on this topic because I am I'm passionate and very opinionated on the, the topics in both of these papers. So I, I want to caveat my comments by saying in advance, uh, you know, in many cases they're based on, on personal experience and recollection and that may be erroneous and I take full responsibility if I misremember something. But if you looked at my marginalia for reviewing these papers, the drafts, they're scribbled with things like, that's not the way that happened or all the way from on one end of the continuum all the way to amen, probably on the other. Uh, and so th this is sort of a, a, an area of, of education, educational assessment that I, I have a lot of strong feelings about. So first I should say, um, you know, I think this, this is, I, I love the organizing framework of how assessments or tests uh, have been organized into categories and, uh, you know, for the entire endeavor, for the entire volume. And when it comes to monitoring tests, which I do think is the right way to think about this bundle, uh, this, this is a fantastic introduction to the, the concept of a monitoring test and how they're used. And I, as I said uh, to Jim earlier this morning, I wish I had these papers like 15 years ago. It would have been extremely helpful uh, professionally in, in a variety of different uh, things that I've had to go, go do to have had this kind of an overview. Of, even, of course, you would have to turn back the clock. It would have to not have all the information it has today. Uh, but it would have been extremely helpful to, to just see the, this kind of uh, coherent thinking and organization around some things that not everybody necessarily draws connections among. So I. I I uh, would like to congratulate all the authors on, on that clarity. So I'll, let me take the, the papers in order in more detail. So the, the first, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very solid overview of NAEP, and I will say in advance that uh, uh, NAEP, uh, you know, I'm sorry to you all that you've worked on some, even a tangential part of it now because NAEP has a way of sucking you in and you will never not work on it again. <laughs> um, you think that you got out of it and it pulls you back in. Uh, but, but it's because it's such a fascinating program that is so central to so much of, of what we all think we know about what kids know and are able to do in the United States. And so thank you for the overview. Uh, I also, I actually really liked the, what you call the framework, the organizing framework with the four uses of assessment uh, for system monitoring. Again, I thought that was extremely helpful. Uh, I wish I'd had that years ago. I used to teach a lecture called the political economy of the national assessment. And if I had had that framework, that, that lecture would have probably been coherent. Um, so it would have been nice. All right. so. So now, you know, again, some, some things that I might change or some, some recommendations. Um, so I'm extremely cognizant of the fact that you were, had severe space constraints and you should take anything I say with a grain of salt. I, I totally understand and respect how hard it is to cram a lot of information in a small space. Uh, and so you've got to make some decisions about what's worth covering uh, or, or what's worth footnoting or what's worth leaving out or not, not worth covering. There are some really important policy debates and issues around NAEP that get short shrift in, in the paper as I read it, and again, this may be intentional or it may be because of constraints. You, you mentioned in passing uh, the, the population coverage issue, what we used to call all the time the full population estimates. It, it, it shows up just sort of at the end of a sentence someplace. That was a really big deal, and it still is. Uh, sort of a, a major question about the validity of a monitoring assessment is how do you deal with those who don't take it for various reasons and, and what should you do about imputing them? And whether or not, again, that you can tackle that is, is an open question. 
I, I also thought that the paper was somewhat lacking in the discussion of the frameworks and the National Assessment Governing Board's role in the frameworks. NAEP is all about attention, what they used to call the three-legged stool, right? attention between or among the Governing Board, uh, the NCES, and the, the major contractor, whoever's got the major uh, execution contract for NAEP at any given time. So for our, you know, the, most of our experience here, and, and Henry mentioned it, the, sort of when there was a major transition there, but it's been ETS uh, leading a consortium there. But th that's not just a random, you know, fact about government procurement or something. This is actually where the, the tough political choices about what's in NAEP and how it gets done are made. And, and sort of those frameworks are really is where the governing board has asserted with legal backing, you know, with, with legislative backing, that they are the ones who get to decide what's important that we measure, what kids know and are able to do. NCES gets to decide how do we do it, in theory, and set the budget for it. And ETS and their colleagues actually have to do it and figure out how to actually make it happen. Uh, and that sounds like those are distinct, but they're not. And so there's a lot of the tension and, and understanding why NAEP looks the way it does is understanding how those, those roles play out over time. Again, there's that's, that's a lot of battles you could cover and I understand you can't cover anything, everything. So, you know, again, I, I'm happy to share, uh, you know, after the fact, all my own little notes about where I thought maybe I have a different recollection of how something happened. Um, maybe a couple that are big enough that are worth mentioning here though as well. Uh, the, the, the discussion over the performance levels, um, <laughs> so I, I, I appreciate now as, as you gave the presentation that Ed Hartle was, was a, a sort of a, a mentor here because when I read it, I think my note was something, this is extremely Ed Hartle centric or <laughs> whatever the appropriate adjective, Hartleific or Hart Hartleic. Um, so because it, I felt like I was hearing him talk when I read those, that section of the paper. I don't disagree, with, I want to be clear, personally, I don't disagree with a lot of Ed's position on this, but Ed does not speak for the entire uh, universe of stakeholders about the utility of the achievement levels, about their validity, uh, and it's, it's an import, again, an important political debate within the NAEP world that you might want to get a second opinion for that section. Um, again, my, I, I tend to fall on the Ed side. This is not a personal thing. It's more like a, but I've been beaten up by, by the other side and the other sides. Um, the, the, the data part, so then the, the paper sort of pivots. I noticed, I think the, the figure you showed here was amended from the figure that I had in that version, which is good because I think you fixed all the things I was gonna say were wrong in the figure in the version. Um, the second one, I'm not sure I would include, the, the big aggregate thing, because you're aggregating over multiple subjects, as you know, if you're looking for space, I'm not sure about that one. Um, then the paper kind of takes this turn into the description of the Stanford Education Data Archive. So again, I understand it's not necessarily a paper about NAEP, um, but I did find that part a little puzzling. Now I understand more why I think you did it. But I, I guess for a few reasons. So again, now I'm probably getting more into personal territory. So you mentioned in passing the uh, series of reports that NCES put out that map NAEP NAEP, NAP, MAP, the state's primary proficiency cut scores to the NAEP scale, right? And this was, a, again, a really interesting both methodological and political period where we tried to show that, and actually I used to say about this series of papers, uh, you know, this was the, the project that I've ever, more so than any other thing I've ever worked on in my life where you knew that it was wrong, right? The, the methods you were using and the results you were getting were fundamentally flawed, and I used, Inside nape joke, sorry. Uh, but, but yet, uh, yet, yet the, the finding was true, right? What we were saying had an inherent truth to it, which is that the state's proficiency cut scores were all over the place and that they were not all equal. And so that trying to shine a light on that for sort of policy purposes was more important than, than waving your hands and saying, I couldn't get this right. Um, one of the people who told me how wrong it was and really kind of beat us up over it was Andrew Ho, who was a dear friend. Uh, and so I returned the favor to him because I was so shocked when, when he participated in the CETA thing, which glosses over the fact that all of these state tests are testing different things and it's not what's on NAEP, and that's exactly why we weren't supposed to do the report we did all those years ago. 
And so that problem isn't, hasn't gone away. They just kind of wave their hands over it. And I was glad to hear that there's a validity agenda for this data data because I think it's needed. Um, but I would caution against, for example, there's a line in there that stuck with me where you're saying that, that the uh, CETA could be used, I should find it, to, to identify success stories for further study. That's sort of like what we don't want people to do with the ILSA data, like go fly to Finland and find out why they're doing things right. At, le at the very least, don't select on the dependent variable and only identify cases that are positive. If stakeholders, you know, if policymakers are going to read this volume, give them good research advice and don't tell them to go look at a, somebody that's got a high CETA score. I mean, that's not a thing, but you know, a high performer to go ask them what they're doing right, or we will set education research back, you know, 20 years ago. All right, let me turn, because that's, that's running out of time, and I want to save some comments for, for you guys. So, okay. <laughs> so, so again, really solid uh, historical overview. I wish I had it years ago. I think I had to learn all that history the hard way by talking to the people who were there for many dinners. Um, I guess here's a quibble, and I don't know how you handle this. So you couldn't get through the presentation without talking about Andreas Fleischer. <laughs> because you can't get through talking about Ilsa's without talking about Andreas. But you did get through writing the paper without mentioning him. Yeah. And I don't know how, that, how to handle that. So personalities are so important for why the Ilsa environment looks the way that it does. And no personality right now is probably more important than, than his. Um, you, know, you mentioned Doc Howe, which is great. You mentioned other people by name, but he, to me that was just this giant gorilla in the room, elephant missing, right? Like where was Andreas? And, and I, you know, what would I have said? I don't know. Again, I have strong personal opinions. I totally agree, and I'll come back to the point at the end here about ranking, but we wouldn't have that problem without people pushing it, and those people aren't nameless. Um, but again, this, the point of this volume is not a ad hominem attack, nor is it a, you know, I don't know how you handle that. I'm happy to help think about it. Um, but, you know, if you've got one person who, even the reason why there is a PISA as opposed to just Tim's and Pearl's goes back to one person who used to work on one of them and now started the other one, right? It's a, it's a hard not to, to, it's hard to disentangle that. Uh, smaller points. So you, you mentioned the governance dimensions of the, uh, the IEA assessments as, as sort of a contrast, right? And I think you're kind of dancing around the Andreas rules with an iron fist on one, but in the other one, countries can get things changed. <laughs> I'm putting words in your, your paper. Um, I, so I would, I think there's a little nuance there. So the, the yes, it's true in, in one sense that, you know, countries that are members of the IEA General Assembly have more ability to get um, their agenda pushed through. But they're not all equal, kind of like the Security Council in the UN. The, the standing committee, which you don't mention of the IEA, is made up of some, some rotational members, but some permanent members. And the most important one is the United States, which as long as I can remember has always had a, a seat on the standing committee, which basically means that we kind of have veto power over most of what goes into IEA assessments. Not in every case, but it, it's not, they're not all equal. And we were first among equals in, in my memory when I sat on that committee. So I think that the, again, if you're, I don't know that it's necessary, but if, since you go into the, the sort of the political economy of what gets assessed, you probably need to mention the standing committee. Um, I, I think the paper, you probably need to discuss in more detail the OECD partner economies. You mentioned them in the presentation today, but the paper kind of glosses over and just says that there's these OECD partners, or these OECD member states. Um, same with the jurisdictions. I think you note that the OECD brought in these other jurisdictions, but I, as I recall, I think Tim's did that first with some, a couple states in a Canadian province or something. But, uh, just, just, you may even want to put the classic list or the map, like here's the people that are in this, right? That's sort of the, the easiest way to just, you know, as of X, year X, here's all the people that did it. And that's too, too neat detailed. All right, so I really appreciated the section on cross-cultural equivalence, because I really think it's, glossed over in our use of these data. Um, again, this is not a paper on cross-cultural equivalence, so you can't do much more there, but I guess thanks for calling attention to it, and if you can fit any more in about it or any other 
you know, I think you had a, you cited some pretty obvious classic references, but there's some maybe a little bit of other work there. Uh, just getting stakeholders to understand that that's a real potential problem in the user, I think, was is useful. The DBA, the digital part, I guess I quibble a little bit with the, yes, going to a computer-based assessment allows adaptive assessment, but we have pencil and paper adaptive assessment examples even at large scale like the L's and L's. Um, you might want to come up with other things that it allows or did allow, like, like, and I think you mentioned a little bit, but this will come back to another point at the end. That, one of the things that I think is a, a stronger sell than ad adaptivity for digital assessment here is the new uh, item types and new constructs, and you do mention that, which is good. Uh, but there's less in there about the this proliferation of new international assessments altogether, which I want to come back to at the very end. All right, so then you turn to the section, what are ILSAs good for, which is great. In fact, my, my note, I copied my own margin note over my note said, this section is a necessary tonic for the endless stream of questionable inference coming out of, in particular, the OECD. So I'm quoting myself. But I, <laughs> I, I wanted to get it right. I, I absolutely. So can quote you. you can <laughs> quote me quoting myself. Um, I, I, I really appreciated that section. The, the, I, I, would, I might quibble, though, with the order of your best uses. You put the best, sort of the, what these are used for table. Um, because I felt like a little bit of the discussion there conflated validity for those uses with the normative idea of what's best, what, what best uses are. Like, it, these assessments, these tests may be good for something, but that thing may not be good. Or it may not be good for something, but we wish it were because we want that thing. And, and sort of there's a normative dimension of this. I don't mean in the assessment sense. I mean in the, the things we think are good sense. Um, so for example, do, we, do you really think that ILSAs are validated for disturbing complacency? <laughs> they do it, <laughs> but, but why? Uh, I, and I would probably elevate your number three and four over number two. I mean, when I think of what are these good for, they're good for description. They're good for trend first. And then maybe they're good for transparency, depending on how the country uses the data. And then they have this awful side effect, maybe, which is that they disturb complacency, unless you're the person that wants a hammer to disturb complacency, and then that's what they are good for. But I, I guess the, the, that's what I'm trying to get at. Um, I love the international examples of disturbing complacency while we're on that subject. Um, it's great to see those all in one place. I feel like those are anecdotes that people always tell, but, but I've never seen them all written down together, and it was really helpful. Uh, maybe the England example, which is probably the most powerful, I'd take it, it's, it's, it is disturbing complacency, but it's also just a great example of bad inference. Um, so you could use it in a different class. Uh, you know, selection on the dependent variable, uh, you know, it, with apologies to Steve Glazerman who coined the phrase misnapery for the bad uses of nape. This is a great mispeasery example. Um, yeah, that's too detailed. All right, so. Rankings. Let's let's end there. Um, so I, again, I completely, personally, professionally agree with your position on the mispeasery use of rankings, league tables, um, probably for most of the same reasons. I do think that the first two reasons you cite, that student performance depends on environmental and social factors and that uh, cumulative achievement matters, are both true but I don't think there are reasons why rankings are bad. They're, they apply equally to any yield study, right? Any, any like PISA is a yield assessment of 15-year-olds at a point in time. Um, even if you took the rankings away, PISA would still be limited because student performance depends on environmental and social factors and, and cumulative achievement matters. The, the rest of your points, though, that, that uh, they don't encounter, usually don't incorporate uncertainty, that the country set varies, that are absolutely true. And uh, anecdote, so when we used to present the rankings, when new PISA came out or new TIMS, uh, so if we presented them to, to Arnie Duncan or to, to policymakers in the department or, or the White House, we actually would produce two sets of rankings and one was whatever PISA was gonna say, but one we would take out all the countries that had changed. So we would say, how is the US doing relative to the people who only were in it last time? Which is, to, I mean, the 
graphic's not up there anymore, but I'm looking at it, the Japan example. Um, and it, it, was, it was always remarkable. It was a really big shift. It, it helped them understand why they were seeing some of the changes, and we would use that to prepare their, them for what they were going to get in the media. Um, I guess I would say to both papers, I really appreciated your comments on the limits of causal inference, you know, the limits of these data uh, for, for use of causal inference. I guess unlike the, the here, unlike the Nate paper, the ILSA paper uh, discusses longitudinal data, and there's a good reason for that, because NAEP, of course, is, is uh, prohibited by Congress from collecting longitudinal data. Um, I, did say, I think in that discussion, you, you, you talk a little bit about like a synthetic cohort approach of taking the, the different grade levels within the same administration and stacking them up for growth, but there are some real country examples of true longitudinal uh, PISA and TIMS where they've gone through retain the sample and gone back to them multiple times. So if you want to explore that, you could. I guess my last challenge to the ILSA authors, um, and I, you're totally aware of this, but so you come up with some recommendations looking forward at the end. Um, and then sort of your recommendation is, well, let's have an expert board, right? Which we're at all, everybody here probably is on a dozen expert <laughs> boards. Um, I, I th it struck me as weak tea. I, I, but I don't know what to do better, but I'd love to do something more in their face than just another expert panel to be ignored, <laughs> but I, I'm happy to think about that. I guess the only other thing I, I had hoped, and again, I understand space constraints, I'd hoped that maybe you would tackle, uh, was this proliferation of other topics assessed in the ILSAs? So we've got, you know, reading math and science in PISA, you know, reading and math and science in TIMS and pearls together, but then PISA keeps doing all these other crazy things, right? So every administration comes out, we've got problem solving, then we have collaborative problem solving, then we have something called global competencies, which I still don't understand what it is, and I sat there and read the framework and was in that meeting. Uh, now they've pivoted, financial literacy snuck in there, and then we pivoted again to have uh, creative thinking, which I actually was on the expert panel trying to talk them out of it, but, but somehow got associated with it. My problem with all these things is, is the constructs are poorly defined in many cases, and they don't stick with them long enough to actually make them work. In contrast to things like NAEP, where we have agonized over how to measure, what to measure and how to do it for decades. Um, they just, whatever whim of a new policy idea that we think global competency is something we should be measuring get thrown in there. So I wouldn't mind, if you're looking to take shots at some of the international regimes, I would, I would take a shot there too. All right, let me stop. Thank you. I hesitate to think what you would have said about the other papers you were supposed to discuss. <laughs> but um, uh, I just have a couple of things I want to comment, and then I'm going to throw it open because I can't resist either. Um, you made a comment about you can never escape NAEP. Um, well, that's true because the first time I ever got sucked into uh, a project at the National Academy of Sciences, that gentleman back there who's sort of hiding um, got me to chair a committee on the evaluation of NAEP that led to the uh, infamous, fundamentally flawed response for some of you may have heard about is the uh, about the achievement levels. But of course, that followed on about three other reports that preceded it that basically said achievement levels were fundamentally flawed. And yet we still have the achievement levels. Um, the other is about PISA. Um, and uh, I just love examples about PISA and, and what it can do to a country. I, I, I remember being at a meeting <clears throat> Once I actually think it was a meeting that Canute you uh, you sponsored uh, held at Keel, um, and uh, that was the first time when I learned that uh, that the PISA results had turned Germany upside down. So much so that there was actual television show, a PISA show, and there was a Dr. PISA. Uh, Manfred Prenzel was Dr. PISA. Um, I just like I thought somebody was pulling my leg, but that was you know. Um, 
uh, uh, you mentioned also about PISA. Uh, I just don't get me started on their assessment of collaborative problem solving and problem solving and creativity and whatever else. But you, I think you said it well, and I do think it bears some conversation in terms of, of you know, uh, one-off constructs that are poorly defined. Um, I just want to say one other thing about rankings and ratings. I happened to be the dean of Peabody at the time that the U.S. News and World Report first started issuing rankings for graduate schools of education. Some of us were a little upset with some of those rankings, including the fact that places like Harvard always came out on top. And one of the things was uh, we pointed out to them that one of their criteria was the number of graduate students they had per faculty member. And we said, that's, you know, that's a curvilinear relationship. No, we can't deal with that. So places like Harvard and Teachers College always came out at the top on that indicator. And so we said, well, maybe you can change the indicator. And they said, no, we can't deal with something that complex. The other thing we learned was that um, the only way they can sell their magazine is the rankings, and the way they do that is by tweaking the, the values of some of the indices from year to year, because if, if they didn't, there'd be no thing, things would not move around. Um, so, so much for rankings. Uh, in, in, so that's my, that's my little diatribe. Um, so I'm going to toss it open for questions, comments from, from the audience. We have time. And the microphone is here. Um, Anybody else want to beat up on Nate for pizza? People want lunch. <laughs> People want lunch. Mike. So is that next? Oh. Yeah, I don't want to beat up. No, I have a question. So um, I have a question about the rankings and the rankings that are I mean, I think what I'll say is that, yeah, we, I mean, we discussed it a little bit, and as uh, Jack mentioned, uh, which, by the way, thank you very much. The feedback, hopefully, is going to be helpful, but um, it was really sort of a space issue that it, with all the things we were trying to discuss, I think maybe you're referencing that I think we have a footnote that sort of discusses this issue, but I mean, I think if we can, we can try to find a way to put it in, but uh, that was the reason that we didn't discuss it, not because it's not something that, yeah, I think is very important to consider. I, don't know if that's so, I mean, in the NAEP context, <clears throat> I would draw a big distinction between accommodations and the, the full population estimate. Finding the people who simply are, were sort of defined out of the population originally and then trying to figure out a way to see what would happen. Uh, both are really important, both from a measurement perspective, but also politically. Particularly in the, uh, so the states went through a whole fight over uh, accommodation rates and, and eventually that what, what what was offered and how many people got it and that was essentially resolved by NAEP policy but the the TUDAs the trial urban districts which get a little bit of mention in the paper but again it's a whole other area you don't have another 10 pages to do on uh, it's a huge issue there still right so so if you're a big city school superintendent and you and, the, and there's rankings so you end up finding that oh you know Cleveland is, is Philadelphia is beating Cleveland the argument always comes down to, yeah, but they exclude a lot more kids, right? Or their accommodation policies are different, something like that. And so it is a huge factor in the debates, of, particularly about how the assessment is used. It's probably worth mentioning, but again, with space, it might be hard to fit. It, it is a key factor now because states are monitored for uh, special education costs. And they're monitored by the state department. Sorry. <laughs> it is a key factor. Um, in the accountability at the state level is their NAEP participation rates and states can be moved up or down um, in the special education accountability. So I, I just, uh, it's the point of the, the impact of the, on the system and the political decisions more than the technical aspects of No, I, and, and that, to that point, I mean, that was a specific request by the GAO which forced a report to, 
use NAEP to try to shame the states about their, uh, their, their exclusion rates, which became a long-running series of reports, which is still used for that purpose. I mean, you could do a whole other paper here about a political, you know, political uses within the United States of these data or something. But. And although not about accommodation for special needs, internationally there are other exclusion issues that pop up. So in uh, when um, Shanghai was entered in as a jurisdiction into the testing in, in PISA, uh, students who were enrolled, if you were a migrant from the countryside, you couldn't get access to the schools. So huge fractions of what we would think of as age or grade eligible students were excluded by, from the Shanghai data, and not surprisingly, the rankings were higher. And then you also have differential dropout rates for the older age assessments across countries. So in a lot of low income countries, you've got kids who are just not in school, not necessarily because of special needs or, or a particular exclusion, and those vary tremendously across countries. So it's, it's cross-cultural equivalence in the instrument, it's cross-cultural equivalence in the sampling, it's cross-cultural equivalence across a whole range of things that are not equivalent across countries. Eric, Rick? So sometime in the past I asked Henry why rankings were bad, um, and I'm still not convinced that rankings per se are bad because the use of rankings to say whether the schools versus some other factor is more important is obviously bad, but so is the use of achievement levels. Um, and I don't quite understand the, what you would want to do. You would give an ILSA, you aren't allowed to tell whether Poland is better than the U.S., but you do what? Well, I, I think our argument is that it's not that rankings are bad in the sense that they, they are a particular way of extracting <coughs> summary statistics from a very broad range of data. The real problem is how they are over-interpreted and misinterpreted for policy uses. Uh, um, Carnoy uh, has a nice example where he shows that if you disaggregate, um, I think it's the uh, PISA scores, uh, by uh, something like family academic resources, so you're looking at by socioeconomic stratum, that you and you look at the United States versus other countries, by stratum, the U.S. is doing pretty well. The problem is that we have more kids in the lower socioeconomic strata than other countries, and because of the the relationship between socioeconomic background and achievement, our overall uh, achievement looks more uh, more problematic. Um, which way you want to do it? I mean, it's in some sense, what's what's the what's the question you're trying to answer? So our argument is really more that rankings are so easily misinterpreted because people think they know what they mean and they think they know how to properly interpret them is that they're kind of a dangerous uh, a dangerous weapon. But as Judy indicated, it's not likely that we're going to uh, eliminate them because they're just too attractive for the sponsors to give up. You could use, I mean, so for, for one, rankings take a continuous score and it discretizes it. It makes it equidistant when it's not necessarily equidistant. And more perniciously, it makes the people who are interpreting the rankings, who do not have the level of sophistication of people in this room, conclude that there must be a meaningful difference between a place that ranks number one versus a place that ranks number two. And if you look at the uncertainty associated with the scores, there is rarely a meaningful distinction between those. So they are so seductive, and, it's, and, and, and I, I t take Jim's point about the rankings of universities, the rankings of schools of education, whatever it is, they're so seductive. It's, it, it's like cocaine, you just go to it. Um, and, it's very hard, and it's very hard to wean yourself from the addiction once you start it. <laughs> but, but you have to, haven't told me an alternative. I mean, the, it, when NCS gives the countries in PISA, they're colored differently by whether mm -hmm. they're statistically significant mm -hmm. from the U.S. And so you have un uncertainty 
in there, but the countries are ordered by their scores. But there, there is another alternative. I mean, let, let's say that we're not going to eliminate rankings as, as a media event, but if you, if you accompany those rankings by uh, confidence intervals based on the uncertainty around the scores, you would see in almost every case that countries that are quite separate in the rankings are not not significantly different. And that then relates to the issue that, uh, the point you made, which is you could then argue that uh, even though these countries are above the United States, they're not significantly different. I think there are ways of, of easing the comparison by recognizing the, what is oftentimes substantial uncertainty above those rankings. And in, in the case of the, uh, the graduate programs, as you may recall, there was a, uh, I guess it was an NRC report where Paul Holland developed a very elaborate simulation approach, a bootstrapping approach, to generate uh, uncertainty intervals around those rankings and again showed that, uh, that schools that were ranked quite separately were in fact not significantly different given the uncertainty uh, in the scores. Leaving aside the question of whether the components that were used in the rankings were appropriate, whether the weights were appropriate, but given all that, there was still a, a great deal of uncertainty that, that should have uh, moderated over-interpretation of, of individual ranks. Maris? And then this is just a simple question. Uh, about 20 years ago when I looked at NAGB, I was surprised by a paradox, I thought. Uh, things were actually being done in a fairly nonpartisan way in terms of proficiency things. There were technical issues, but they were do it didn't seem it'd be particularly political. On the other hand, every time the results for American history or civics came out, if you're off a number one or two, it meant the world to that uh, administration. So I'm just wondering what's happening now. If, for example, when we eventually get a new president and he or she uh, is looking around and, and worrying about the American history or, or civics, particularly civics, and wants to get the numbers up, what's to prevent them from putting on the NAGB governing board individuals who see this in a different way and say, look, this isn't just about professional historians' idea of American history. It's about the average citizen and the various things, and suddenly your score is going to rise of proficiency. Is that possible? I don't think Ben can well, I think I may one. defer to some. Uh, so uh, I'm trying to understand the mechanism. So the mechanism would be, you know, the uh, Secretary of Education, with the President's blessing, appoints some new governing board members who have different ideas about the framework. Totally possible. They rewrite. That's absolutely possible. Then they get together, they put out a new framework in civics or in history. Uh, you know, the good, yes, that, so in, the, in a sense, like mechanistically that's possible, you know, Congress could step in and be more prescriptive and say no, um, and that there are some examples of, particularly under, you know, when Lamar Alexander's staff wrote something, I mean, you know more about this than I do, right? Some of these examples where, where Congress weighed in on the content, we see it more in some of the other data collections, but, but in theory, yeah, that could happen. I, I think compared to other Assessments, though, NAGB is, is conser small c conservative in terms of not wanting to change the frameworks. And, and one of the checks on them that I've personally, you know, lived through is, you know, the old saw, if you want to measure change, don't change the measure. What NAGB wants to do is change the measure all the time, but also keep the trend. <laughs> and in, in 20, uh, 2005 math, at NCS, we judged that they had changed math too much and we had to break the trend in the 12th grade. And if you look at that report, the 12th grade main math data point for the nation is one. There's one point and it's set at the mean or whatever the scale, we rescaled it and recentered it. And then it moves on from there because we told them, no, you can't have that both ways. So one of the things that a, a good <coughs> NCS should do in, in that event is stand up and say, all right, you have the legal authority to change what civics means um, but I'm going to tell you that that also blows up any trend you have, so your administration will be out of office by the time you get a second data point. Is that what you want? <laughs> That's what I would tell them. It would be interesting to see if they listen. The reason I say that is that people who disagree with the American history standards and, and that seem to have no difficulty of stirring up uh, almost unanimous vote in the Senate to uh, that. It's, it's a plausible scenario. Carl? 
One of the one last question, and then we'll get summary comments from the panel, and then go to lunch. Sure. <laughs> one of the mysterious aspects of the horrendous Atlanta cheating scandal was that um, they had done well on NAEP, um, even though there was significant evidence of cheating on state testing and. The Council of Great City Schools was quick to advance that argument. Has any, is anyone any closer to solving that mystery other than you can cheat on NAEP also? I, I, again, this, I'm happy to talk about that offline because I'm not even on this panel really, but the... the <laughs> We're going to make you an honorary <laughs> member. <laughs> I, I spent a lot of time you on that question. I I, I'm not going to write this. Uh, we actually have, it, it's available for the, because it was put in the public record of a presentation that I gave to the governing board about stepping through why I still believe to this day, but why then I believed that Atlanta public schools did not cheat on NAEP okay. uh, and yet did cheat on their state assessment. And that unfortunately it's not a neat story. It's possible to have both student achievement grow and also be cheating. Um, Sonny Perdue was on the board at that time. And it was a it was a very rancorous discussion because he he pulled a, I mean, it's a long story it's, it's a dinner time story but but that that, sli that slideshow is available I mean because because Ed Week or somebody put it out right right after we presented it but for for a lot of reasons in, in fact I mean I still believe this to be true they did not cheat on NAEP during that period uh, but they did so the score growth was real the NAEP score the NAEP score growth was real yeah. So I'm going to ask if we just sort of wrap this up and final comments from our panelists, Ben. Ben? Uh, sure. Well, I think first, uh, thank you to Jack for um, the feedback. I think this is very helpful and uh, led to a good discussion. Um, uh, I don't think it necessarily makes sense to go through uh, point by point all of the things, uh, the points that you raised, but uh, certainly I think it, it'll be helpful to think about how we can sort of maybe cut down on certain things and, and add in a couple of the a little bit more balanced perspective on some of the achievement levels, um, discussing the, the government go, governance uh, accommodations and exclusions. Um, and I think then the, the last question about, you know, is this the wrong way to get the right answer or a good answer? Um, you know, we could probably discuss a little bit more as well. And I think for us, it's sort of a tension between um, constructing something like CETA where we get uh, very approximate answers uh, or data about questions I think a lot of us feel are important as opposed to saying, well, we can't do this perfectly, so we should do nothing at all. And I think that, that it is sort of a constant tension, but uh, perhaps one we could discuss a little bit more. So, but again, thank you all for listening and, and thanks, Jack, for your comments. Henry? Yeah, thank you, Jack, also uh, for your comments. And I will just say that having done some of the work on uh, mapping state proficiency standards into the uh, NAEP scale, I would quote John Tukey who said, an approximate answer to the right question is better than an exact answer to the wrong question. So, now of course that doesn't mean that we had an approximate answer to the right question, but I'll leave that aside. That's, that's again a matter for dinner. Well, we're going to have a very long dinner, I think, tonight. But I want to just uh, address one point that you made right at the end, and namely this uh, interesting aspect of PISA where each administration, they, they go for this new sort of sexy kind of um, construct, whether it's collaborative problem solving, global competence, and so on, and then the next time they go to some, that is deliberate policy decision by one person. <laughs> and the intention is to kind of make sure that every administration, there's something interesting that he can talk about, mm -hmm. he or she can talk about, <laughs> um, to the press, in addition to the legacy. So it's a, it's a deliberate policy decision and has very little to do with uh, the, the quality of the assessment itself. And, and again, I, you know, if there were really a fourth or a third uh, domain that was really interesting, then it would be worth having a trend line and seeing what's happening. That's not the point of that agenda. Judy? Last shot. No, I talked too much already. <laughs> All right, so I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, that's it. Thank you.